uh, is doing uh, the ministry for the Lord. Cats uh, provide you uh, theological lectures and retreat and spiritual practice, uh, which is very uh, needed in this uh, changing society of 21st century. Uh, during this time, we invited uh, Dr. William Purinton, uh, as I introduced him already before the sermon. He is a researcher and a scholar and a professor, and at the same time, a missionary. He is working a lot uh, mission related work, particularly with the OMS, One Mission Society. He is a teacher, professor, and coordinator to uh, missionaries who are coming to Korea. Uh, he is running a summer uh, mission school. Oh, so powerfully, he is influencing the mission workers and missionaries in the world. And uh, today is a very special day, as we know, as All the Skate Sunday. Uh, most in case, we just uh, listen to John Wesley's theology. Uh, somehow, we approach theoretically. But at this time, uh, Dr. Purinton uh, is an expert uh, 20th century and renewal movement, obviously, which is related to John Wesley's Holy Spirit movement. And June 2nd and 3rd also, there is a huge conference uh, on uh, Jonathan Edward in uh, Samonan Church and also in Ansan on uh, C.S. Lewis by Dr. Uh, Alistair Macress, who was my teacher also when I was studying at Ruth Theological School. He is a, a professor at Oxford and he, is, he was invited by the Korean church. So it's kind of a linked uh, spiritual movement how we uh, Christian church has been formed during modern time and postmodern time. So today, very special. Uh, Dr. Purinton will introduce how that uh, renewal movement uh, during 20th century, particularly early 20th century, happened in the States. Uh, so we will invite him. And then uh, as we begin, uh, can you pray? Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for blessing each one of us. So that providing this wonderful catch lecture by Dr. William Purinton as he speak. Uh, help us and help him to listen and to deliver your word and the how the church activity and how the spiritual church has been formed in this world. Oh God, be with us and send your Holy Spirit so as we listen, uh, feel the power of your Holy Spirit. Keep Dr. William in your hands. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Okay, now welcome him with our plus. Thank you. And you have the manuscript before you, and I will be giving some instructions on skip down to, skip down to, and that's kind of pretty typical whenever someone reads a paper. We always, we had the, the Korean expression, big hand, <laughs> so we, we always make too much, right? A lot. And you can take the leftovers home with you, and you can look at the, the parts we skipped. So it'll be, I have to confess something. Um, the title, Burning Love, I got from the king, and that was not King Jesus, but King Elvis. Uh, that's one of uh, the King's songs. Uh, if you know Elvis Presley, you probably know that. A hunk, a hunk, a hunk of burning love, yeah. Uh, I got that title, and I was trying to think how I could fit it in, but uh, I won't be doing an Elvis impersonation. Sorry about that. We will spend some time looking at Wesley. And the Wesley part will probably be about half, and then we'll go on to his grandchildren. Now, if you know anything about the life of Wesley, John Wesley had no biological children. He married late, 
and he married late enough so that his wife would be unable to have children. And he really was almost celibate, but got married late and never really planned on having children. But spiritual children and grandchildren, he's got millions. And I would call the children the Methodist Church and maybe uh, holiness tradition as well. And the grandchildren I would call Pentecostals and Charismatics. Let's go ahead and begin. Today we'll be looking back to the beginnings of Methodism and John Wesley's theological formation. When some scholars look back, they see Wesley's theology as a product of Western Latin theology, Augustine. Others see it from Eastern, which would be Greek theology, Chrysostom. One area that is commonly agreed upon is the Anglican roots of Wesley's theology, but we're far enough away from Anglicanism that we really don't appreciate the fullness of what that means. And when I say far enough away, we're uh, in the 21st century, the Anglican tradition is quite a ways away, although geographically here it's not too far away, just down the street. And then we look at the 18th century, we can see the influence of both Puritanism and Pietism in almost an equal proportion. John Wesley thought of himself as a Christian from his mother's womb. His father was a pastor, an Anglican priest, and his mother, Susanna, also was the daughter of a pastor. Susanna was a godly mother who taught her 19 children religious and moral instruction. As a child, John Wesley survived a fire at the parsonage. He was miraculously saved. His mother thought of him as a brand plucked from the burning, quoting from Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2. John and his younger brother Charles went to Oxford for their university studies. The Wesleys and George Whitfield joined together with other students at Oxford and formed the Holy Club and had other names that were less kind, like Bible moths. Uh, ridiculing them for having passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to have more chapel services and not less. Interesting. He would sail with his brother Charles, younger brother Charles, for Georgia in British North America. Charles served as secretary to Governor James Oglethorpe, and John was a missionary or chaplain, you could call him. There was a scandal in Georgia. John returned to England as a failure. He met the Moravians again. Peter Bola was John's religious advisor. On May 24, 1738, the D-Day, we call Aldersgate, he was listening to the reading of Luther's preface to his commentary on Romans. Wesley's heart was strangely warmed. John Wesley's testimony is that in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle of the Romans about a quarter before nine while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. After Wesley's religious experience, he no longer doubted his salvation. He had renewed confidence to preach the full gospel. He would visit the Moravian community of Herrenhut. However, he was disappointed with the pietists and decided not to join them. In an attempt to reach more non-Christians or unchurched folk, Wesley's younger classmate from Oxford, George Whitfield, began to preach in the fields of England and in North America. Wesley began to also preach outdoors in England. While Wesley preached in the open, people began to respond to the gospel. Some people would weep and loudly bemoan their sins, while others would collapse in anguish. Then they would express great joy, declaring that they felt cleansed of their evil. Wesley would have preferred more solemn proceedings. Eventually, he decided that what was taking place in such instances was a struggle between Satan and the Holy Spirit, and that he should not hinder the work of God. 
John Wesley and George Whitfield worked together in ministry for a while, but their theological differences became an obstacle. Wesley leaned toward an Arminian position on salvation, stressing free will. Whitfield continued to be faithful to Calvin, stressing predestination. George Whitfield began to organize his followers with the support of the Countess of Huntington. They were called the Calvinist Methodist Church, and their strength still is in Wales. Wesley wanted to remain an Anglican and not form a new church or denomination. But the number of people who came made it necessary for some organization. Wesley set up societies of people who met for preaching, but continued to receive Holy Communion with the Anglicans. The Methodist societies were first organized in Bristol. Later, the societies were divided into classes. Each class had 11 members and a leader. They met weekly to read scripture, pray, discuss religious matters, and collect funds. John Wesley continued to travel throughout the British Isles, preaching and organizing the believers. When the Bishop of Bristol complained about Wesley's independent preaching, Wesley responded, the world is my parish. Some people believe that also has something to do with his ordination by the University of Oxford, meaning it was kind of a special kind of ordination, not local, but more universal. Other Anglican priests began to join the Methodists. One of them was his younger brother, Charles. Charles was a gifted hymn writer, and you probably know a lot of his hymns are in the Korean hymn. Not as, much, not as many as Francis Jane Crosby. Fanny J. Crosby has the most in the Korean hymnal, but I think Charles is second. The Methodists began to allow laypersons to preach the gospel, but not to administer the sacraments. The organization continued. The followers were formed into a connection. Societies were joined together to make a circuit under the leadership of a superintendent. The Anglicans began to persecute the Methodists. Wesley did not want to divide from the Church of England, but they made it difficult to remain in the same church. In 1787, Wesley could, would tell his preachers to register with the government. The American War of Independence also made it difficult to remain united with the Anglicans. John Wesley himself was against the independent group. He was a royalist on the side of Britain, not the American patriots. Thus, in 1784, Wesley ordained two lay preachers and designated Thomas Koch as superintendent of the churches in America. In order to make their stance official, in 1786, the conference decided that wherever the Anglican church was unable or failed to minister to the people, the Methodists would set up meetings, would send Francis Asbury to America in 1771 with the intent to preach and lead the churches. As an anecdote to the whole Wesleyan tradition, I'm able to trace my own ministerial ordination through the International Pentecostal Holiness Church and earlier through the Methodist Church. I am a card-carrying Pentecostal. We even actually have these little cards, all the ordained ministers. The denomination I'm ordained with is called the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. And they came from the holiness tradition before that Methodist. So the founding bishop of our denomination was a Methodist pastor. And if you trace his ordination all the way back, it goes to Asbury Coke Church of England. Now, I don't believe in apostolic succession, but it is kind of interesting to know that we are family in more than one way. After the death of John Wesley and all the circuit preachers of the 19th century, let's go to the 20th century to see burning love get even hotter. The 20th century is called the Century of the Holy Spirit by Vincent Sinan, an American historian of Pentecostalism and renewal movements. As we begin the 20th century survey, we first see a Methodist pastor named Charles Fox Parham as instrumental in the start of Pentecostalism. Let's go to, let me see which part. I 
I have two manuscripts. I've got the big size that I can see and the small size that you guys can see. Let's try the middle of page three. The middle of page three. Finally, finally after the renovation. Finally after the renovation of an older building, Bethel Bible College opened for classes on October 15, 1900. It was located in the old stone mansion in Topeka, Kansas. Parham gave his 40 students a homework assignment. This is a Bible school. Their only textbook is the Bible, and usually it's only 30 or 40 students. And the only professor, teacher, is the pastor, Parham. So his assignment is for them to search the book of Acts to find the Bible evidence for spirit baptism. Parham's desire was that his students would know the end-time missiological strategy based upon the book of Acts. Again, their assignment, find the Bible evidence and look in Acts chapter 2. This sounds like a setup, giving the answer. Here's the quote from the life of Charles Parham written by his wife, Sarah. Sister Agnes N. Osmond, now LaBurge, asked that hands might be laid upon her to receive the Holy Spirit as she hoped to go on to foreign fields. At first I refused, not having the experience myself. This is Parham talking. Then being further pressed to do it humbly in the name of Jesus, I laid my hand upon her head and prayed. I had scarcely repeated three dozen sentences when a glory fell upon her. A halo seemed to surround her head and face, and she began speaking in the Chinese language and was unable to speak English for three days. When she tried to write in English to tell us of her experience, she wrote the Chinese, copies of which we still have in newspapers printed at that time. The newspapers in Topeka, Kansas City, and St. Louis carried the story of speaking in strange tongues at the Bethel Bible College. Parham was convinced that this was the renewal of the missionary gift and that all his students would be able to preach the gospel to the nations in their own languages. Charles Parham opened a Bible school in Houston, Texas in 1905, moving down south. I already talked about that in the connection with William Joseph Seymour. So let's go on to page four and the middle of the page already. So let's jump on over to how this message of Pentecost goes from L.A. to the ends of the earth. The list. Do you see that right in the middle? The list of Azusa pilgrims included Florence Crawford, Portland, Oregon, William Durham, Chicago, C.H. Mason, Memphis, G.B. Cashwell, North Carolina, Glenn A. Cook, Indianapolis, R.E. McAllister, Ottawa, Ontario, Rachel Size Love, Missouri, and Samuel Sell, Arizona. An example of the early Pentecostal periodicals and their testimonies is Frank Bartleman's report in The Way of Faith, August 1906. Strong men lie for hours under the mighty power of God, cut down like grass. The revival will be a worldwide one without doubt. Already through the Fire Baptized Holiness Church, the people of the South were accustomed to exuberant worship. After praying through, people had already experienced the holy dance, hallelujah earthquakes, and shouting. There was already an expression among holiness folk for such demonstrative worship. Shouting Methodists. I've heard that before. Have you? Shouting Methodists. G.B. Cashwell, I want to read quickly his testimony. And that's at the bottom of page four. About two months ago, I began to read in the way of faith the reports of the meeting in Azusa Mission, Los Angeles. I had been preaching holiness for nine years, but my soul began to hunger and thirst for the fullness of God. The Spirit led me more and more to seek my Pentecost. After praying and weeping before God for many days, he put it into my heart to go to Los Angeles to seek the baptism with the Holy Ghost. 
As soon as I reached Azusa Mission, a new crucifixion began in my life, and I had to die to many things, but God gave me the victory. The first altar call, I went forward in earnest for my Pentecost. I struggled from Sunday till Thursday. While seeking in an upstairs room in the mission, the Lord opened up the windows of heaven, and the light of God began to flow over me in such power as never before. I then went into the room where the service was held, and while Sister Lum was reading of how the Holy Ghost was falling in other places, before I knew it, I began to speak in tongues and praise God. A brother interpreted some of the words to be, I love God with all my soul. He filled me with his spirit and love, and I am now feasting and drinking at the fountain continually and speaking as the spirit gives utterance, but in my own language and in, my, and in the unknown language. I find that all has to be surrendered to God, our own language and all, and he speaks through us English, German, Greek, or any other tongue in his own will and way. Okay, you can read later the many countries that had influenced and became vehicles of communicating the message of Pentecost. It's amazing. This network was through newspapers that were not on the internet but were hand-delivered by the mail system. Think about that. A hundred and some years ago, people were getting newspapers about the news of the mission in L.A., and they were going there to get it, or they were passing it on to other countries, including Brazil, which now is the largest Pentecostal nation in the world. It's also the largest Roman Catholic nation in the world. So I don't know if that's a setup for a fight or a hug. Let's go now to page seven. Page seven. In Korea, Mary Rumsey, yes, we can do that, page six. Page six, second paragraph, thank you, thank you. The Pentecostal movement did not reach Korea until 1928. Many years after the revivals in Wonsan and Pyongyang, 1903-1907, Mary Rumsey, an American Pentecostal missionary in Japan, arrived in Incheon and began to establish the Pentecostal movement in Korea. After receiving the Pentecostal experience herself at Azusa in 1907, she returned to New York, that's Rochester, and studied at Elam Faith Home and Missionary School. She had minister, ministerial credentials with them as well. Rumsey's ministry began at Methodist Hospital in Seoul. She began to lead Pentecostal services at the hospital. Later, some Koreans joined her ministry. One of the earliest converts was Ho Hong, a member of the Salvation Army. They began a church named Sobungo Pentecostal Church in Seoul. Uh, I do have some literature that shows the address. I need to check it out. Uh, I think it's Dongdaemun, if I remember right. Uh, Park Song San also joined them in ministry at the church. The new name of the church was Joseon Pentecostal Church and Mission Center. Mary Rumsey had to return to the USA during the war years by order of the Japanese government, being an American citizen, of course. Another prominent Korean evangelist was Lee Yong do Although he was not a Pentecostal, actually a Methodist, his preaching and ministry style was very similar. In many ways, he was a mystic. The American Assemblies of God continued the ministry of Mary Rumsey in 1952. They opened a Bible school in Seoul, and one of the students in the first class was named Jo Yong Gi. In 1958, he would begin his ministry in a tent that would later grow to become the world's largest church, Yoido Sumbogum Kyoe. Okay, so that's kind of the short story of that. Okay, thank you. Now we can go to page seven. From right in the middle. Highlighting the charismatic movement. From the beginning of Pentecostalism, there had always been times when non-Pentecostals experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit in tongues. 
Receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit in tongues meant, however, that you would convert from your church to Pentecostalism. Neo-Pentecostalism is a different phenomenon. People would receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit in tongues and would remain in their own church. Other mainline Protestants and evangelicals began to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit and tongues. Among them were, you can see the names there, and you can see Ross Whetstone, a United Methodist. Indeed, the new wine had come to the old wineskins. Typologies are ways of making distinctions, classifying and helping to make the pieces fit inside a whole. Henry Van Dusen called Pentecostalism the third force in Christendom in an article in Life magazine, 1955. Leslie Newbigin in The Household of God views three streams within Christianity, sacramental, evangelical, and Pentecostal. D. William Falpo, in his The American Pentecostal Movement, organized classical Pentecostals as belonging to one of three groups, Keswick, views of sanctification, holiness, views of entire sanctification, John Wesley's influence, and Jesus' only view of the Godhead. That would be the United Pentecostals and some other groups that baptize in the name of Jesus. And now let's go to, um, let's see, page eight. Talking about the third wave, the third wave. Second full paragraph on page eight. What about the third wave? It was a term coined by C. Peter Wagner in his The Third Wave of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> third wavers do not see themselves as belonging to the first wave, Pentecostal, or to the second wave, Charismatic. Leading up to the third wave were the healing evangelists, especially William Branham and Oral Roberts, and the latter reign. One of the third wave groups is Calvary Chapel, in December 1965, Chuck Smith, ordained with the Four Square Church, became the pastor of a small congregation in Southern California in Costa Mesa. Three years later, they became independent, leaving the Four Square denomination. Calvary Chapel became part of the Jesus movement when Lonnie Frisbee, that's his real name, a hippie convert, moved in with the Smith family. There were many mass baptisms in the Pacific Ocean. The mother church in Costa Mesa began to give birth to many daughter churches that are all over the globe. A second group is the vineyard churches. There were vineyard churches from the mid-70s, but the real impetus of the movement began when John Wimber led his Yorba Linda congregation from Calvary Chapel to the Vineyard Association. Vineyard churches see themselves as the radical middle between evangelicals and Pentecostals. Wimber was raised in a non-Christian home and later became a successful executive in the music industry. He was a music producer and he produced albums for a group called, I'll check your age now, The Righteous Brothers. You've lost that loving feeling. Okay, if you're old enough to remember that song, you know The Righteous Brothers. He was a music industry exec became a real Christian. And of course, he goes to seminary and becomes ordained with the Society of Friends or Quakers. In 75, Wimber joined C. Peter Wagner of the Fuller Evangelistic Association. They begin to co-teach a D-Men seminar. It's called Signs, Wonders, and Church Growth from 1982 until 85. This was a very controversial course at Fuller. If you know about Fuller, in the United States, Fuller is the largest seminary in the United States. It started in 19, I think, 46 or 47, and now has about 3,000 students. The reason it was controversial was Wimber teaching with Wagner. In the class, they would lay hands on students and cast demons out of students. Well, word got to the administration, this was not really too cool uh, at an evangelical seminary to be doing stuff like that. So it became quite controversial. And C. Peter Wagner himself becomes even more controversial outside the classroom. Bottom of page eight. 
The new apostolic reformation is a movement to restore the five-fold ministry gifts of Ephesians 4 to the modern church. There is special emphasis on the gifts of apostle and prophet. Wagner calls this movement the most radical since the Reformation of the 16th century, Luther and Calvin. As part of the restoration of the prophetic and apostolic gifts to the church, a number of Christian leaders began to minister in the Kansas City area. This is called the Kansas City Prophets. And of that group, you should probably know or probably might have heard of Mike Bickle and IHOP. Now, IHOP is not the International House of Pancakes. I know, I know that restaurant. Eaten there many times. This is IHOP International House of Prayer. And it's a 24-7 prayer ministry in a suburb of Kansas City called Grandview. They have their own Bible school. And I've met lots of Koreans, including my nieces, who have been there and talk about going there to spend a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Also, there was more revival connected with the third wave in Toronto that they called Holy Laughter. Everybody knows about that, right? Holy Laughter. And that was at a vineyard church that, of course, John Wimber came and kicked out personally. And that was all due to the uh, Holy Ghost bartender, Rodney Howard Brown, a South African Pentecostal evangelist who started actually in Florida. So let me go to the last few paragraphs to sum it all up. David Barrett's World Christian Encyclopedia, page 9, right toward the bottom. David Barrett's World Christian Encyclopedia gave figures that the Pentecostal, charismatic, third wave movements had passed up every traditional confessional group of Protestantism to be highest in numbers, second only to the Roman Catholic Church. Mega churches include Yoido, Sumbogum Kyue, everybody knows that church, Hotebeche, Methodist Pentecostal Church in Santiago de Chile, uh, Vision de Futuro, Deeper Life Bible Church in Nigeria and Brazil para Cristo. How do you keep the fire burning, that burning love? Max Weber spoke about the routinization of the charismata, meaning that dynamic movements become organizations by the second generation in the absence of the original founder's fire. Another question is whether or not Pentecostal charismatics can become agents for change outside of the church in society and politics. And this is being answered in the affirmative, in the affirmative, especially in Central America and South America. Predictions made as early as the 19, in the 1970s by the World Council of Churches saw the real growth of the church to be, number one, non-white, number two, from the Southern Hemisphere, number three, Pentecostal or charismatic. This lines up with Philip Jenkins, the next Christendom, the coming of global Christianity. Thank you. Dr. Purinton used the 30 minutes uh, for presentation, yes. Now it's time to uh, uh, any responses from audience, any questions and comment, and uh, then Dr. William will uh, respond to you. Any questions? Of, uh, the question I had for you was about the development of religious nuns in America and to what extent uh, this new movement could engage this community. Very good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, religious nuns. I was thinking Catholic nuns, sisters, okay. I know what you mean. I would say that there is a group of 
Now, the one thing that I, that I probably failed to do in this paper that, that uh, I would be castigated for maybe at an academic conference is I didn't really connect the dots completely between Wesley and Pentecostalism because, frankly, that's very controversial. And a lot of people don't see much connection. But I went ahead and <laughs> started coloring in all the places. But yeah, the religious nuns, actually a lot of people are being attracted, probably in the States, there are two churches that are really growing. One is the Emerging Network, which is getting the attention of nuns, uh, those who have no church background. And really, and, and nuns is more not people who uh, never went to church, but went to church and got burned out or got s and sick and tired of evangelicalism. So the emerging church is getting the attention of some of these people, and there are all kinds of emerging church now. Some of them recently have had some problems, if you know what's going on in America, some of them big problems like Mark Driscoll. Uh, the emerging church is one, uh, one option. The other one is the prosperity gospel. And, and this is connected with Pentecostal charismatic movement, and a lot of people would call it uh, a wrong direction, would not be happy with the prosperity gospel. But it is catching the attention of millions of people in America, especially in the African-American community, and a lot of people are really grabbing onto this message. I mean, think about Joel Osteen. I would call that prosperity gospel. That's actually America's largest church, Lakewood Church, uh, non-denominational charismatic. So I think those two might be getting a message that's being heard. Uh, but the, the whole thing about Pentecostalism is they still hold to the radical, radical experience. And that is still attractive to nuns. I mean, I don't want business as usual, Sunday-only church. I want something radical, something wild to get my attention. And, and Pentecostal Charismatic and the Third Wave definitely have that. And if you even know anything about IHOP, if you see what's going on there, it's very attractive to people who are, it's, it's not really too churchy. It's really different. And they even sometimes have rock and roll music. So that, all that kind of stuff. Hooks, hooks get the attention. Good question. May I ask yes. questions? Uh, in the case of John Wesley, yes. uh, he, he also had a radical experience in yes. terms of a spiritual uh, experience. Uh, not only on May 21st, particularly in the Path Lane uh, gathering, yes. Yes. and also uh, January 1st mm -hmm. uh, in 1739. Yes. Uh, their prayer meeting was a radical Pentecostal yes, experience. Night. And mm -hmm. after that, many uh, radical things happened. Yes. And, and, but uh, John Wesley didn't stop there. He integrated his spiritual passion with uh, social uh, transforming yes, yes. Uh, movement. Yes. So that uh, in the link to Pentecostal movement in America and also uh -huh. overall in the world these days, how you can connect with the John Wesley and Pentecostal movement? With the, the social justice. Yeah, social the social justice. justice. I do believe in the third world, I hate to use that word, majority world, it's happening. It is happening, especially in Central America and South America, especially Brazil. There are Pentecostals who are on the leading edge of social reform and social justice. In America, things are still a little more on the uh, retrograde, on the conservative side. In fact, some of the uh, prosperity gospel people have been very much uh, in favor of President Trump and the kind of Republican agenda. So they've been on kind of that side still, along with many evangelicals. Uh, but there are, uh, in the African-American, I must emphasize, African-American, in the paper I say that Pentecostalism has two parents, a white and a black. And the African-American side is not socially, uh, theologically conservative, but not socially conservative. 
So we can see a lot, especially in the largest Pentecostal denomination in America, the Church of God in Christ, which is African-American and sadly is overlooked by most historians and theologians. But they are definitely uh, on the cutting edge. Excellent. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. So thank you for your lecture. And can you uh, find some relationship between uh, charismatic and Pentecostal movement and economic growth, especially the whole economic growth in whole country mm. in certain stage of uh, different uh, economic level, mm -hmm. probably Pentecostal movement can um, be stirred up, but in quite stabilized uh, level, uh, it's hard to find that kind of movement to study it mm. or something like that. Mm. Now, I can't see a direct uh, relationship between Pentecostalism and economic growth, uh, but I can say that for Pentecostals themselves, this whole idea of prosperity gospel, Pentecostals traditionally, if you look at the biographies of many, and, and of course this is again controversial, there are some people who say Pentecostals were kind of the working class or uh, lower class, the proletariat, uh, some people saw them uh, that way. In fact, there was a book written by H. Richard Niebuhr, who was professor at Yale, uh, The Social Sources of Denominationalism, and he saw them as the church of the disinherited. So in Korea, you would call that minju. So they were kind of the church of the poorest of the poor, and many of them uneducated, even illiterate. Uh, and so you can see some of that. So they were at the bottom, and they started coming up, that economic lift. And the same thing you could say in Korea, uh, the theology of hope and the theology of prosperity are kind of cousins. And it depends on how you hear that, uh, whether this is my uh, chance to get more money or it's my chance to help my neighbor. So it can be a very selfish thing. I'm coming up. So yeah, people have economically come up. There are now universities. Oral Roberts University is a good example where there used to be Bible schools. And you can look at the cathedrals, the large buildings. When I think about Lakewood, uh, I've never been there personally, but that building they bought used to be the basketball arena for the Houston Rockets. And I mean, unbelievable the millions of dollars they have. So these people have money and they're coming up, but question, will that economic lift for me be an opportunity to give to my poor brother and sister? That's the question. So yeah, there is some economic lift. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, thank you for your lecture. Just a question that I have. Um, I would like to pose it to you as a church historian, mm -hmm. and I would like you to look into your crystal ball. <laughs> what will the church look like in 30, 40 years? Mm -hmm. If we look at the uh, uh, upcoming of the nuns, which is a real force mm -hmm. all over the world, um, the Pentecostals, the Wesley, uh, children of Wesley, yeah. what, what do you think the church will look like? Well, when we look at the parts of the church, global church, that are growing phenomenally, just like Jenkins and just like the report from the 1970s by the World Council of Churches, it's sub-Saharan Africa, it's Latin America, and it's in Asia. And that growth is not always among what we would call classical Pentecostals. There's a group that Barrett identifies. Barrett uh, is an Anglican whose background, I think, is in statistics or computers, something like that, and he became an Anglican uh, priest later in life. But he did a lot of statistical work, and that's how he came up with that encyclopedia. He's talking about non-white indigenous, and many of these churches are prosperity gospel. So I think the real question will be, how fluid 
are we theologically? Because right now, we're saying those people are heretics. What they're preaching is not traditionally called evangelical or even ecumenical. They're really going to an extreme, but they're growing. And you can see some of these prosperity groups in sub-Saharan Africa doing some really wild things. And many people are disturbed by this. Now, some people go there and embrace it. But when you see the pastor who becomes a bishop, who now becomes the Messiah, <gasps> what? He is our Christ. And a lot of people are concerned about that. So it's, the question is, the church is growing, but is, it's not in the pattern that we're accustomed to. But if you're a sociologist, not a theologian, I happen to be a theologian, so I'm a little bit conservative, but if you're a sociologist, you're just glad to see things grow. And so what if it's in a different context? And so what if they're pushing the envelope and tearing down the walls? But that's where the real growth is, and I think that's how we handle that. African-initiated churches is one example. The World Council of Churches has opened the door, membership, to some of those churches. And the National Association of Evangelicals in America has opened the door a little bit, but most people are weary and cautious. Yes. I have two questions. First of all is the Dallas, Texas, there is a Christ for the Nations, yes. the kind of charismatic uh -huh. school. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> how do you evaluate that school and, and Gordon Lynch's his ministry, the charismatic ministry? And second, my question is, then how we can help to those radically, you know, third country just gone too far right. to <laughs> only charismatic way, not a, the, the word of God. Yeah. I believe my personal understanding, personal opinion is to fix those, the back to word of God, plumb line, the uh, Bible, teaching, the educating the Bible. Yes. The, that's the word is the plumb, this basic measurement. Mm -hmm. So I believe if we educate the uh, word of God in that charismatic whatever is movement, and there will be more balanced. I think in, we, we need to worship in truth and in spirit. Yes. I think it's a part of charismatic we need actually. If not, we will dry. If we too much academically the way, literal the way, then we will dry. So we need both, but it's a balanced way of worship in truth and spirit in the word of God and prayer time. But it's too far, one side radically, that's the big problem. So can you answer that question this first? Okay. Yes, Christ for the Nations uh, is really a global movement, and they have Bible schools all over. Now for them, the Bible school is, and even IHOP has the same thing, their school for ministry, they usually call it is sometimes just one, two, or three years at the most. And then from there, they go out to ministry, never to return to the halls of education. And they've got some tools, and I think we could probably help if we have some ability to connect with those people and converse. The problem is we're on completely opposite sides of the planet. We're almost on different planets. And we don't even know those people. We don't, I'm, I'm surprised you know them. That's really a good sign. But yet they've got Bible schools all over. And they're putting branches all over the world. Uh, and they do have dynamic worship. Uh, when I think about Carrie Job and her music ministry, and she came out of Christ for the Nations, and some others, uh, dynamic music ministry, and the, what you might call the, the idols of CCM, they came from those schools. They, they didn't go to the University of Chicago, Divinity School, or Princeton. Uh, they went to those schools. And those same people are being missionaries, too. So I think we could have some conversation and uh, connect with them. But at least we have to know each other before we can have a conversation. We have to know each other. So that's my first step. Thank you. Yeah. question to you. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, as we see, uh, I heard that uh, Europe and the United States, yes. uh, most of those big church buildings are empty. And there is a Christian, uh, you know, believes there many people are still Christians, but they don't go to church. I wonder whether that is the, related to the economic growth. And in that sense, now Korea, since 1950, our country is very poor, and now we developed our economic growth so fast, so much. Yet uh, our Christianity moved, you know, pretty big during the last 50 years. But what will be happening in Korea, the church populations, and are there any possible situation that the church will be empty in Korea? like Europe or USA. But your prediction and your you know, thought. Oh, I'm humbled by these questions. Um, what you're talking about is post-Christian, post-Christian experience that's going on in Europe and some people would say North America. Um, again, when you see some churches closing, you look across town and see other churches opening. So it's not even, in, and actually even in Europe, yeah, the, the traditional cathedrals and denominations are dying. And you might even make a case for that in the U.S. with the, what we call mainline denominations. They're going down in attendance, but again, some of the prosperity gospel and immigrant churches in America, the fastest growing churches are Hispanic. And that's true of all denominations. So if you go to any denomination, United Methodist Church, PCUSA, any mainline or even evangelical or Pentecostal like the Assemblies of God, you ask them, where's your fastest growing church? And you find out it's usually Hispanic or Korean American or African American. It's an ethnic church that's growing. And some of these are staying within the denomination, the, the Anglo white denomination. Some are becoming separate and growing. And this is all, and same in Europe. Uh, one the largest church, what was this, maybe 20 years ago I read about this and I saw in Kiev was an, a Pentecostal church pastored by a Nigerian. Amazing. He had immigrated to Kiev, Ukraine. And he was pastoring the largest church in the Ukraine. And he's African. He's preaching in the Ukrainian language. Uh, amazing. And the church is not just immigrants from Africa, but it's Ukrainian people. And you can see the same thing in North America. And maybe it will happen in Korea if there's a group of immigrants. Talbuk. <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm just speculating, but yes, prosperity can and does kill our faith. Okay, thank you. Uh, church is growing, but more important thing is that we need a healthy church. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, now it's time to wrap up, right? Okay, uh, I ask Reverend Rainus come up and pray for closing.